today my guest is Yuan Boeta. Um, hi, Yuan. How are you today? Hello, David. Nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, so can you introduce yourself and uh, sure. and what interests me, of course, if we are because we are in a podcast on on service management, on value management. So your experience in this field. Thank you. Yeah, the, the best is if you want to know more, go to my LinkedIn profile. Um, but the short introduction is I come from an engineering, social and management uh, studies background. Um, I started as a very technical person. Um, I was a mainframe engineer that physically repaired boards that we took out of the, the mainframe. There was no CPUs then. It was all discrete logic a long time ago. And um, then I moved into networking and eventually into management and then from management into consulting. Um, so today I, I consult, I train, I uh, lecture at university um, and I coach. Um, I've written a bunch of books. Um, I often speak on podcasts, sometimes on conferences. Um, and my passion is to help people, help organizations to do things better, um, more meaningful and more sustainable. And that's me. Oh, quite a, a, an experience and rich profile. So I can see. Uh, I like the uh, what you said about uh, the fact that uh, you are passionate in what you do. Without that, you can't do your job anyway. I know what I mean also. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and when you, when you said that you you coach that you train that you uh, for instance um, also um, teach at university, do you have any preference? Is there one of these activity that you prefer uh, to the others? Hmm, that's an interesting question. Um, probably coaching more than anything else, because you can really have a, a, a close connection and you can have an impact on somebody's life. Um, and I would say most probably second to that would be you know, standing in front of a group of people. Um, but yo, that's difficult to say. I, I love you know consulting also. But we, you know when I say consulting, I mean real consulting. Yeah, you know, many people run around and say I'm a consultant, but they're actually a contractor. I'm not a contractor. I, I give advice, and you have a choice. You can follow my advice or not. <laughs> yeah, and, and that that's also what I say when I'm delivering some training courses, you know, to prepare uh, students for an exam. I always say the same things for them to remember the segregation of duty. If they pass the exam, it's thanks to me. If they fail, it's because of them. That's as simple as that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I, I think that's 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 a that's a good line to use. I'll I'll remember it for the future. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't say it also works for for consultancy, but <laughs> but uh, it's true that uh, that that's also the the reason why uh, I think many uh, um, I would say organizations uh, who owns uh, frameworks are very cautious with that. You know, the fact that not to be so prescriptive. Because otherwise the organization can, uh, you know, say, yes, you said I have to do it this way and you see the results. So it's because of you if we fail. So uh, what what and, and when, when we talk about framework, I saw that you um, developed a very uh, important and I would say successful framework called ADAPT. Can you yeah, talk so a bit more about ADAPT framework, please? Yeah, so I've been involved in, in, in best practice development since 2005, I think. So quite a quite a few of them, and our, our latest um, set of relatively prescriptive guidance. And I'll explain why why adapt is not a framework and a, and a method, and rather a method um, is to help organisations. And originally, the intent was industrial age incumbents to transform digitally, but subsequently we realized um, anybody can use it. Um, the, the principles is not bound to to somebody necessarily uh, wanting to go from an old um, uh, 
reference to a new reference in ter terms of, of, of age, so to say. Um, yeah, and, and, and the reason why I say it's a method, because I was also involved in, in a framework called Verisum. Um, and um, yeah, when we talk to people about Verisum, people always say, it's great, you know, it, it, we, it, we, we find a lot of value in it, but you know, what are the steps? Uh, as you know, a framework is not supposed to have steps. Yeah, because we try to describe the world and it's for you to choose what is appropriate for your context. So eventually I gave up and I said, OK, if people want steps, I'll give them one version of the truth. And that version is is, is now called ADAPT and the A and the D and the T stands for Agile Digital Transformation. Um, and it's high level steps. Um, it's nine steps. It's three phases. There's a strategic stage with three steps. Then there's a, a tactical stage that focuses quite a lot on innovation with three steps and then more of a, a, a operational stage. Yeah, making things real uh, also with three steps. Um, and the reason why, why I say it's a method is because there are definitive steps. It is, however, high level, number one, and number two, it's iterative. So you, you start at one and when you get to the end, then you start again. Sometimes not at the first step because the first step is about purpose and your purpose of the organization doesn't change that often or it shouldn't. So quite often we go then just to step number two. Um, and a cycle through, through the, the, the method takes about three months. So that means every three months something has truly transformed within the organization. You know, we say, we say we talk about digital transformation and 90% of the projects that I see out there are not transformative. They, they're about digitization, but it's not transformation. Transformation means that the organization looks different. They act different. They, they transact different. They've got probably a different value proposition but the engagement with people are definitely different. Yeah, so um, one of the, the guys from MIT, and I can't remember what his name is now, he, he made the statement, he said, digital transformation is about making beautiful butterflies. It's not about making fast caterpillars. And I look at many of these projects that's busy happening and it's all fast caterpillar projects. It doesn't make a difference. I won't say it doesn't make a difference, yeah, digitization is important, but it doesn't change the organization. And our intent is to help organizations realize that if you want to be competitive and function in a digital age, you have to fundamentally rethink the way that you create value for customers. Yeah. How you engage with people, what your value, value proposition is, how how you deliver that also. Yeah. Um, that's what where the digital actually comes from. <laughs> um, it's actually not digital transformation because digital doesn't need to transform. It's a tool. Yeah, it's your organization that needs to transform. Mm -hmm. But the primary tool that we use is new digital technologies or the abilities that's created by uh, by new digital technologies. That's very interesting. So. Um... So in fact, you 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 are the believer of uh, of this uh, theory, which is also in Title IV uh, regarding digital transformation. That digital transformation allows an organization conducting new business or different business or doing its business fully differently. Yes. By using digital products. So that's that's the idea. If I just sum it well, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the idea in ITIL was also yeah, borrowed from people that came before us. Yes, of um, course. <laughs> I and, know that. Um, as, as you most probably see on the website, there were some of the ITIL 4 authors also involved in ADAPT. Um, so it wasn't a solo effort. Yeah, it's a, it was 32 people from all over the world that collaborated. Um, I just played the, the anchor role. Yeah, so I was the 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 hub of of the uh, of the wheel yeah where everything got together 
Yeah, which is which is a, uh, I, I would say a very great uh, achievement, and this is the kind, honestly, of project that I really love uh, because it really involves uh, different people from different cultures, from different experiences, and that's the way it works. And and at the end of the day, you really see an added value to what you do. So that's that's the uh, the main, I would say, rewards to um uh, to to your uh, method, and that's and I really. Uh, uh, for that, uh, we should, uh, uh, frankly, a uh, 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 true success on this. Can you I quickly say, interject before yes, you ask the question? Yes, please, please, please. If you like it, become involved, number one. Yeah. So um, the current version of the base text of ADAPT is the second edition, and we start working on the third edition of the, of the, of the book in December. Um, so anybody out there, if you like, what you hear, yeah, contact me, become involved. It's not only about certification, it's really about as a community to try and make a difference and help people to to achieve things. Okay, so in, in fact, it means that if everybody who is, listens to us uh, is interested, get in touch with you. The best way to get in touch with you, I presume, is via LinkedIn, no? Yeah, my LinkedIn profile is the best. The best. In fact, I'll I'll make it even better for you. Anybody that's listening to this and likes it, if you go to smashwords.com and you look for Johan Boeta, that's Johan with two N's, not one N, um, you will see two of my books listed on Smashwords. Um, the blue one, this one, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, buy it and use the following code to get a 100% discount. D- 9JSM, all in capitals. Okay, I will make sure that, of course, in the video, you will have all that clearly displayed for people not to make any mistake. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah. And then you can go and read the book and then you can make up your own mind if you like it or not and if you want to become involved or not. But this is, um, I mean, I started my consulting role in IT service management. Um, and I was fortunate to be early in that life cycle. And there was this awesome community um, in the late 90s and early 2000s um, in IT service management. And I'm trying to recreate that intense connection between amongst people. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. to a large extent, it's been lost. Uh, yeah. There, there may be different reasons for it, but there's no reason why we can't recreate that. I loved it. I learned a lot from other people. Um, so if you want to, if you want to contribute, become involved. If you want to learn, become involved. Yeah, both. <laughs> Good. I think it's uh, clear enough, and um, I think it deserves another mm, talk together regarding, for instance, this community, because. Uh, um, what I feel and uh, is that uh, we are now, uh, yes, um, in a, we, we need to renew this generation. There is a new generation, obviously, when you were talking about people very active uh, in the late 90s, in the, in the or 20 years ago. Obviously, this is one generation before, uh, after that now needs to be involved or even you. do, yeah. <laughs> And and, and 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 some people, you know, uh, say that there are some new waves. You know, I I I, I read uh, um, I, I read you know Rob England saying that uh, uh, Gene Kim and 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 these people involved in DevOps are like the new wave of service management. The only new wave I know as a French is La Nouvelle Vague in the uh, movies, which is something that you may know. I didn't know that there was a new wave in service management. I think it deserves another debate. <laughs> is yeah. there a new wave? As I a 50 years old guy, I am in the new wave. I am in the old wave. I am in the middle or I am in no wave. I don't know. I don't do surf, but that's a question <laughs> <laughs> that we can discuss elsewhere, you know? Yeah, but sure. definitely there is a generation gap that needs to be filled in order for people to understand that service management is not a bad word. <laughs> Uh -huh. and, and the cool thing is we, we, we're getting more and more younger people involved in, in, in the community also. People who are enthusiastic about um, things. And uh, one of the reasons is most probably because the, the value system that we, that we stand for 
um, is is non-industrial age. Um, yeah, so um, hopefully the, the method is uh, also um, exudes, if that's the right word, I hope so, um, a, a different spirit, yeah, who projects a different spirit. The, the fact that, yeah, we live in communities, we need to become involved. We, yeah, the world is not only about us and about money, yeah, um, there's, yeah. There's, there's other things also. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, you mentioned, you know, you 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 are describing quite well your your uh, adapt method, and uh, of course, which is uh, mainly focused on on digital transformation. But and you said, for instance, you described this uh, three months life cycle. Okay, uh, what? Because you know, everybody is talking about digital transformation, and at least you give, a, 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 I would say, a, a very interesting definition of that. But how you could measure? A success of a digital transformation. What would a successful transformation look like? Yeah, that's a that's a that's a good question. You know what the difference is between good questions and interesting questions. Good questions I can answer. <laughs> okay, so for the moment I, I only have good questions. Anyway, <laughs> this, is a, this is a good question. Let's yeah. see the the, the 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 next step. We will see. <laughs> yeah. So the only way that you actually measure or that you can measure value because we your podcast is also about value yeah. is is to to think about outcomes yeah um but we need to be very careful that we don't only think about outcome in one dimension yeah so it's really important that the right Things are achieved for different role players within the the ecosystem. Yeah. Um, so, and one of the things that I don't like about, um, especially listed organisations, is that we focus so much on short term metric for one of the stakeholder groups within the business. Yeah. Um, and we don't think about long term sustainability. Yeah. So the the outcomes that I want to see is, uh, yeah, do we produce a organisation that's long term sustainable? Do we unlock value for customers? Not because we think we do, because they say we do. Yeah, it's a big difference. Yeah, um, uh, do we unlock value for the, the owners of the organisation because they obviously invest, invest and and want a return, but they just one of the role play, players. And just as important, we do we unlock value for people who's involved in the organization and our com immediate community around the organization. So I want to know if everybody in the organization wants to go to work today. Yeah, feel that they are growing, feel that they're making a positive contribution. I want to know whether my customers are reaching their objectives, the things that that they want to achieve and they weren't able to do it before until we started providing products or services to them. Yeah. Um, I want to know whether the organization will be there in 10 years and still do the same thing. Yeah. When we talk about sustainability, I'm not only talking about green sustainability. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm talking about do we do we have the 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 ability for the organization to continue, yeah? Are we playing the long game, not the short game, yeah? Um, Simon Sinek wrote, Sinek wrote an interesting book um, that is called, sorry, all the books that I reference a lot is on this, within 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 my arm's reach on my, on my desk. Uh, it's called The Infinite Game. Um, so, well yeah. worth, worth read. Um, and we, we need to stop this short short term thinking mentality. Um, when we think about who we are and what the organization is supposed to do and what its contribution is, our purpose, yeah? Um, and when we think about what we do on a day to day basis in terms of creating value, then we need to sh think shorter, yeah? Because the world is constantly changing. So, and that makes it quite complex, and and that's one of the reasons why this three-month iteration uh, of going through the cycle is so useful. 
um, because it it teaches old people like me um, that renewal is important, but it also acknowledges the fact that step number one is about purpose and long term sustainability. So maybe I should just quickly mention the <coughs> apologies, the steps within the process. So the first one is about purpose. The second one is about understanding what our customers need, not what they tell us. Yeah, mm -hmm. we need to go and discover what they need. The, the third mm -hmm. thing is about managing an innovation portfolio. Yeah, and um, giving resources so that we can innovate. Uh, the, the fourth step is about creating an environment in which we can be innovative and succeed. Um, the fifth step is about innovating, and that's product innovation. Uh, so that was the fifth. The sixth step is about business model and operational model innovation, because we need to renew the way that we do things also. The seventh step is about agile uh, design and delivery. Um, the eighth step is about scaling. And when I say scale in this context, I don't mean scale as in safe scale. That's a bad idea to my mind in any case. Um, but scaling reach, yeah, making sure that more and more people actually uh, find benefit from, from the thing that we do. And then the ninth step is to, to be introspective and continually improve. Yeah, look at the things that we do, where we go wrong and learn from it. And 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 pay down technical debt and and fix things. Yeah, um, we we okay. spent spent far too little time on fixing the things that we promised we will do when we have time. And the reason for that is we don't make time. Mm -hmm. Time is a matter of priority. Yeah. Uh, good. Um, thank you for that. One other question I have prepared for you, and then you will say whether it's uh, bad, good, interesting, relevant, irrelevant. <laughs> I get that to you, and let okay. me surp be surprised. I will see. Um, you were mentioning also uh, in some couple of uh, minutes ago uh, the word digital age. Mm -hmm. When you look at some books, like for instance, from product to from project to product, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, um, in fact, one of the first things they say, one of the statements they have, is that we are living in the age of software. Okay. So it means that any digital product, in fact, is a kind of software. Everything is software. Infrastructure as a, as a service, you know, platform can be configured as a software. Everything is a software. Would you agree with that statement? Are we living in the age of software? I think the statement puts the emphasis on the wrong place. It's not the software that's important. It's what the software en enables us to do. I think what we should ask ourselves is, um, how can we, using the technology that we have today, um, answer questions about human evolution? Um, how can we use the superpower that we've been given with all these digital tools to our disposal? How can we use that to make humanity or the future of humanity better. Um, because the reality is, if we don't, we're going to make it worse. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't want to focus on, on the tech as much as the asking critical questions about, even ethical questions about um, how we use technology, because it enables us to do things that we couldn't imagine before. Um, and yeah, I would rather like to believe that we live in an age of, I don't know, kindness and care and, and, and creating new social structures and creating uh, a more sustainable humanity. Uh, however, if I look around me, I'm not sure that, that that's not, uh, <laughs> maybe a little bit of wishful thinking, but it shouldn't stop us from trying. Yeah. Um, even within the evolution of organizations also, making organizations a better place to be. We spend so much time in our working life um, 
And this is something that I respect that that newer ages of 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 or newer generations um, for because you know, I, I find that younger people are much find it much easier to say, no, I'm not going to work over the weekend. Yeah, I've got a life. Yeah, I've got a family. Um, yeah, we, you know, mm -hmm. you and me. No. Yeah, we always we were always there at the expense of what? Yeah. Um, so. Uh, but thank you for asking the question, but I, 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 I think it's the wrong question to ask. Respectfully. Good. So, <laughs> so from the moment I have, I had a neutral one, the introduction. Then I had kind of, let's say, maybe not good, not interesting. In interesting because we were talking about your method, so it should be interesting. Then we jump into an interesting, and then we are in the wrong one. Let me ask you the last one, last, mm -hmm. last chance for me to save my podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't oh. think you asked the wrong question. I think generally, I mean, and that's what people do, and that's one of the problems with digital transformation. We focus far too much on digital and not the consequences of the use okay. of digital. Yeah. Sure. Um, so I think that's a very common mistake that people make. Yeah. If I look at a good 90% of digital transformation touted as digital transformation projects happening today, um, it's not, because it's not transforming the organization. It's not creating new capability for the organization. Um, it makes no difference. We just do things faster. And what's even worse, we encode the wrong things that we do in the digitization. So now we make our mistakes even faster. You know, I, I just think that's a little bit dumb. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so, no, no. So, so in fact, if I just uh, because that's very, very interesting what you said. Uh, so, so in fact, what you what you say when you talk about these ninety percent of cases is that basically organizations are are constantly trying to fill the gap with new and new technologies, trying to be also uh, always, you know, on, on, on using the technology not for the pleasure of the technology but they know there are new technologies and and they know that they need to use this technology but it doesn't mean that using this new technology make their business uh, more competitive make this organization change philosophically with yeah. their a new culture so in fact it's now like these businesses and organizations are um, permanently aligning with the technology and it should be exactly the opposite. That's what mm. you mean, no? Yeah. If I can say this way. Yeah, absolutely. And remember, I, mean, I, I know that you come from a lean back background, you know, um, and, and that's one of the things that, that we said is if, you, if you're looking for waste within the system, the most effective place to go and find that waste is in Mura and Muri, not in Muda. Yeah. 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 And, and that is us encoding the bad decisions of the past to try and make them faster. Yeah. Um, I think there's huge disasters in the making with with uh, many of these digitization projects that's busy running because they are ill thought through um, uh, and ill ill devised, ill put together. Yeah, um, and we're going to pay the price for that. Yeah, remember, um, um, Eli Goldrack said that one of the biggest problems. With organizations, so the first step in theory of constraint is you, you, you bring the whole system, you slow down the whole system, you you subjugate it, yeah, to the, to the constraint. Now, so that's a that's a, that's a artificial constraint that you introduce into the system, yeah, and then we fix the problem, so the the cause has gone away, but we don't take that temporary constraint away. That stops us now from doing a lot of other things also. Yeah. So um there's 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 a huge amount of 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 work that we need to do in terms of um, thinking and planning automation and digitization projects. Uh, mm -hmm. we we don't necessarily change the fabric of the organization, but make sure that that telemetry is built into the automated system so that we can know when things go wrong 
because by automating it, we're actually hiding a lot of the process. Yeah, and just imagine the consequences of that. Yeah. Um, so sorry, this is a little rabbit hole. I suffer from ADHD, so I tend to go into tangents. Yeah. <laughs> no problem. Uh, I, I like that. And uh, just let me, as I said, uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I cannot first interrupt you because it's not polite. And secondly, because what you say is very meaningful and I think very insightful. Uh, and I, I, I hope that people who listen, will listen to that will really appreciate that because uh, I like people with this new, you know, or new. It's not really new what you say and with no offense, but it's a really, really common sense that left many people on Earth. And, and before and, you and ask the be, question, let me yeah. just, it's actually 70 years old because that's how old lean is. Yeah, exactly. You're right. So now let's let me talk about uh, when we talk about lean and when we talk about um, the, 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 you know, there's different sources of waste and, and, and in lean, we also talk about the value streams and you know what I'm trying to say now, because we talk about service management in this podcast, we talk about value management. So mm -hmm. let's talk about value. I will ask you a very maybe weird question because I don't know which adjective you will find. You know, you already say that I'm wrong, good, least uh, interesting. So let me expect the worst. But what about value? If we say, for instance, that value comparing to electricity, you know, electricity can be created. You can distribute electricity on its own. You cannot really store it. Do you think that in that case, value is a kind of electricity? Is it like electricity in, in, in that extent? Um, I, I would say yes, but not in the way that you think. You see, if, if remember I said I come from an engineering background? Yes. Um, your statement is true for alternating current, but it's not true for, for direct current, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, so direct current, we can store. We can store it chemically and we can store it thermally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we can store it kinetically. Yeah. Um, in fact, you can actually store alternating current also kinetically. You can pump water up a hill and then yeah, let it run down again. Um, so is value like electricity? Yes, it is. Because... <laughs> Hmm. We must learn to actually think of creating value capabilities within the organization. That's like making sure that we've got a charged battery so that when we need to respond to a new problem, um, we've got the potential to to respond. Yeah. yeah. So one of the interesting things about yeah, a, a, a battery is that if a battery is in circuit, we use a different term for measuring the voltage than what it is out of circuit. Out of circuit, we call it a potential difference. Yeah, mm -hmm. the bat battery has got the potential to impact and to do work. And in circuit, then obviously it does work. Um, and I think that we need to think about value as um, as 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 a battery also in terms of developing capabilities. Um, within the organization so that when we need to you yeah, to do the work, uh, we are ready to respond. Um, and we obviously can learn from our mistakes. So that's also like storing a little bit. Yeah. Um, and that means that if you think about your value stream, um, in the times that you don't do anything, yeah, because we're trying to get rid of waiting time in between. Um, instead of trying to look busy, we can think about how we can build that potential to build our future. Yeah, um, and have this long-term view. Yeah, this infinite game that that uh, Simon Sinek talks about um, in building a better better tomorrow and a better future. Um, and and. Just bear in mind that when I say we need to build a better future, a more sustainable future, I'm not only talking about yeah, the, 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 the green screen behind you. Uh, I'm actually talking about 
better for for all the role players yeah for uh, yeah. the consumer better for the role players within the value stream um better for the investors yeah uh, better for our families better for the planet uh be better for your society uh, as broadly as possible yeah so i hope that was an interesting answer to your question yeah, but you didn't say whether my answer, my question was interesting or not. Let's <laughs> no, I, 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 I said that. Uh, remember, if, if it's a question I can answer, it's a good question. <laughs> it's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's exactly the difference between you and, for instance, a politician. Because when a politician gets a question he cannot answer, which is 90% of the cases, he will start by, oh, it's a very good question. And you know that the guy will never answer the question. Yeah. We, <laughs> That's we joke exactly and you only say, how do you know a politician is lying? I Your lips know. move. <laughs> I, like, I really like this one. So I really, it was really my pleasure. Uh, Johan, Johan, sorry, uh, to have you today on this podcast. And uh, as the tradition in my podcast, I live in the Czech Republic. So let me um, teach you one small word that can help you in the Czech Republic survive. Okay. Very easy one. It's a typical meal that you can get anywhere in the Czech Republic. And his name is goulash. Oh, goulash. I know goulash, and I make goulash. You make goulash? Mm. Oh, and in French, the trick the is you have bourguignon, which is the equivalent. But yeah, yeah I you didn't have know that. to you have to cook it slowly. Yeah. Until until the 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 the, the skin of the the peppers fall off by itself. Yeah. Mm. So, awesome. yeah, I would I would like to uh, meet you in Prague, and then uh, you can taste the 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 the, the Czech uh, to Czech goulash, which is a bit different from uh, the Hungarian one, and so on. But okay. Uh, yeah, okay. So um. Uh, it was my um, last uh, word about the, the Czech uh, Czech Republic, and uh, and once again, it was a real pleasure for for me to have you today on, on this podcast, and uh, I really thank you for uh, your very insightful, um, you know, uh, I would say contribution to this podcast, and uh, I wish you the best of luck for your adapt method, and of course all the detail regarding your book, regarding the discount um, will be available in this podcast for our Thank listeners. Thank you, David. And I'm going to take you on. So um, I haven't been in the Czech Republic. It's one of the countries on my on my uh, bucket list. Um, and um, I'm a, a, a amateur brewer. And you can guess what I brew. Yeah, uh, because there's only one beer. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, you will, you will be in heaven. You will, if you like beer, you will be in heaven in this country. Yeah, no, honestly, I like the pulse. Yeah, yeah, more yeah, than, yeah, more than anything else. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so this will be this will be heaven on earth for you. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thank you very okay. much. Once Thank again. you very much. Thank Stay you. Well. See you. Bye bye. bye.